It's uh, everything I dreamed of. I would tell my dad that I love him. I still don't know what just happened. I'm just so grateful. Just so grateful for the opportunity to play this game. The legacy is not what you give people, it's what you put inside people, but also what they put inside of me. Hey everyone, welcome to Beyond the Locker Room with Maria. Uh, Trevor and I, we're going to get right to it with T-Bone's take. Hi everybody. Good to see you, Maria. I'm so jealous. I'm in the laundry room because they're prepping so much over there. It's New Year's week. It's Christmas week. It's busy here. It snowed a lot. It's nine degrees. Yesterday it was negative 13. Um, and now you're in green grass and palm trees. So Yeah, I'm in Palm Desert. Um, it's 40 degrees, hence the hat outside. All the boys are inside sleeping. They've been golfing every day, which I know makes you a little jealous. Um, and then yes. we cook big dinners at night and I relax and shop and work out. So it's a beautiful thing. And awesome. um, John's son, Kate, and his friend, Ricky, I couldn't get him up this morning, but he knows about as much or, or knows maybe more about football than even you do. He is oh, crazy. He's a Niners fan. So he oh. gave me my talking points for today. So I have to give nice. Him and he might Dude. be on next week if he's not You're sleeping. Cheating. They've been drinking right, a lot of up. Tito's, a lot of Tito's grape juice. What's the drink called? Tito's grape juice and ginger ale. Anyway. Uh, is that what you're drinking right now? No, this is coffee. because <laughs> They stole all my coffee cups for the golf course. So That's I had to go awesome. buy myself a new one. They're not getting a hold of this one. But anyway, yeah. let's get right to it. Um, first off. Okay. How weird is this? Two days ago at my sister's house, we were talking about John Madden. And I said, I met him once a million years ago. My dad got him to come to Spokane to speak every year. They had these big sports bank. Really? Yeah. And I met him and he was great. And I was just reading unexpectedly at 85. He yeah. Was... God. So last night I was working, there was a line out the door. We probably served 8,000 burgers minus like 4,500. But, um, so we're sitting there and I saw the red flash on ESPN and I was like, Oh, what happened? Somebody's probably getting COVID again. Like, you know, Aaron Rodgers. but wait, he's already immunized. So so it flashed up and it said John Madden had passed away. And I looked over at JC and I told him in his eyes, like his jaw hit the floor. And everybody I told at the bar, they were so bummed out. Well, and I they mean, were saying it's like, you know, he was a great coach for the Raiders, but he really made football fun for the viewers. Even if you didn't like it, he'd go yeah. boing and doink. And, you know, his this personality one? was like, you know, the, the team that scores more points is going to win this game. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, but, but uh, yeah, here go but, for it. Sorry, no, no, he was just a real legend. And we were saying how probably not when he coached, but this is something I haven't looked up yet. But when he was broadcasting, he did not fly because he hated flying. And he yeah, had that's what I was, bus. I was gonna say he drove everywhere, so he would leave. And I mean, that's so cool to uh, there's a couple people that do that. I think that the, the drummer from Blink 182, he was in a uh, he was in a plane crash and he'll only he'll like if they go to Europe tours, he'll, he'll uh, take a boat. Isn't that crazy? But no, John, Madden, I mean, God rest his soul and, you know, his family and everyone. But he was he was an amazing man. I mean, look at I mean, I grew up playing Madden football video games, you know, since 19, you know, 90 or whatever. Like as long as I can remember, I always was playing Madden football. And, you know, it's like I'd always stack my team. I trade for the best players and stuff. So I'd have like my team would be happy every it was like an all-star team but it's just it sucks it's a real uh it's a real sad day for the sport of football and uh yeah. i think that uh everybody really appreciated him and um i don't i was gonna look up a list of his accomplishments i know it's huge and i just it's sad because madden is like is football you know yeah he was an announcer he was a coach he's just so iconic for the league too and i just i i'm that's pretty cool that you got you know your dad got him to speak Oh, yeah. And I was really <laughs> young. And they're, I'm like, hi, sir. I see you on TV. And that's about all. I yeah. Said. And, yeah, totally. and he spoke to this huge group in Spokane, Washington. And um, yeah, he was he was cool and just talked about, you know, he, he was a very positive guy. Uh, and like you said, sport of football. It's And how weird, though, two days ago, we were just talking to him. Talking about him, sorry, not to him. Talking about yeah, him. and they did that, that that documentary just came out on too. I believe. Oh yeah, that's what John was just saying. My man was just saying, yeah, just watch that. So everyone Somebody was it. like, didn't cool. someone was like, didn't a documentary just come out on him? And I was like, well, if it didn't, there will be now. Yeah, you know? yeah. So. so we'll watch all the tributes all day today. Remember, it's Wednesday morning. This thing airs on Thursday. 
But yeah, yeah, God rest his soul. And let's um, I'm gonna start on my list first. I put okay. Seahawks suck. It's the list like yeah. Here. Nick Foles, third string quarterback, came out. He, you know, Nick Foles does have a beautiful career in football and a ring, but does he um, though? Does he though? He only like, I mean, he he does, but like he really didn't he did a lot, but like not until he won the Super Bowl MVP. Well, yeah. So I mean, not a beautiful career, but he has a ring. And the yeah, Seahawks, he shows up for big games. The guys are coming by the grass growers. So sorry about the noise. <laughs> yeah. The grass growers, the, gra- the grass trimmers. There he is going behind me. But yeah, Seahawks. And where uh, where's Russell Wilson going to go? Who knows? New Orleans. I think New Orleans, too. So um, and Miami on yeah. your list. Miami stays hot. Yeah, they went like what? They lost seven straight. And now they won seven straight, and that's the first Miami team to ever do that. I, know. I thought that was. I was like, what a what a crazy, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. So they are, and like your Eagles, hello over the They're, Giants. Did, I think it's like Tua's not doing anything super special. It's like the defense is playing really well, and they score a couple touchdowns. Plus, New Orleans offense is so shaky; they have no quarterback, and like I don't even know who the guy was that was playing quarterback. His name's like Brooks or something. Like, who is this guy? <laughs> yeah, it's like, like yeah. What's the name I don't know the name, but anyway, I, but yeah, yeah. It's just like, uh, who are these people? <laughs> Isn't that funny? But then, um, Dallas, they yeah. I I just can't even. I mean, Washington is so bad right now. Like they lost their best player on defense like four or five weeks ago. They uh, had COVID breakout last week and now everybody, and I mean, Dallas is a good team. It's weird because they're either hit or miss too. It's like, and they really hit the ball out of the park like 17 times that game. It was like 56 to, to 14 yeah. or something. That's we stopped brutal. watching it at halftime. I was in Seattle with the snow. Can't believe we yeah. actually got out, but yeah. So that was, um, yeah, we just stopped watching it. We stopped watching it. It was funny. Than that. Like George, you're, you're, uh, you know, Brother-in-law, your nephew, is that your nephew? Yeah. Oh, George, no, my George, nephew. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he's like, yeah, I was watching the Bears game, and I was like, God, Chicago looks really cold, Mom. She's like, that's in Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, our yeah. airport was sketchy, but yeah, that game, fans were still there though. They went. Yeah. God bless them. God bless them. Oh, here comes the guy again. Um, and your <laughs> Eagles. Oh, we just lost yeah. face. Oh, sorry. There we go. That's okay. I'm coming back. There we go. Sorry. So yeah, your Eagles, Eagles though. Was- they're they in do. the hunt. I know. They're, I think they're actually in the playoffs right now. The whole playoff picture is so confusing to me right now. I know. I, I tried to, like, do a special on it, and I'm like – and I went into, like, playoff conspiracy theories for, like, teams to win and they need help. It's like, oh, this needs – this guy to tie a shoelace and the Cardinals to lose and then someone to sprain their ankle and then the Packers to win and then they're in. <laughs> well, yeah. What? We were trying to figure it all out because there are seven playoff bursts in each league. Um, oh, and by the way, we were watching because they had free ESPN Plus. Peyton oh, that's cool. Steele. And that's it funny. He's funny. funny and informative. And yeah, we were talking about the playoff picture after that. And my brother-in-law is like, seven teams? I go, yeah, because the one gets a bye. The leader of the pack gets a bye. But anyway, yeah. it's totally confusing. But um, Green Bay and Kansas City. Yeah, I don't know. I think I'm going to go with – I think I think the Packers are better. I don't know why. I think I just hate Aaron Rodgers so much. That I think he's, like, ready to go because he's such an arrogant person that he has to win. Well, and now they're saying that because if he wins the Super Bowl this year with Green Bay, that things are really smoothed out now, and he might not leave. He might yes, be okay. Yes, yeah, right. It is so out of there. You know, petting his shoulder. Yeah, and it looks just uh, – like, Arizona was really good. They're horrible now. They lost their receiver. Oh. They're not like JJ Watts gone. They just look terrible. Yeah. Like, and they were so not great. Even I the same. Them. Yeah. It's so bad. I, I am so sad for them. And yeah. also, uh, what is it? Blowing up here. There we go. <laughs> That's okay. And also, yeah. The uh, San Francisco 49ers. You, I'm sure your Niners fan let you know how bad they are. Oh, my God. He had his Niners shirt on last night when we were barbecuing. So, oh, a little Ricky. It was hilarious. Um, so I like your, who's your team to beat, the Packers or the Chiefs? We just kind of touched on that. Yeah. And I, you know, I want the Chiefs because although Aaron Rodgers will probably get the MVP, I'm just not a fan of him this year. Yeah, he's kind of, not yeah, a fan of it's him. whatever. He's, <laughs> my brother was 
talking about that yesterday. I'm like, we don't even need to go there. Okay. <laughs> like we get, I get it. I get it. And, and then, then it's I, so what, go ahead. what is it? The, the Patriots, are they contenders or pretenders? <laughs> that I love. And you. I, and I just, I went this, I saw it on ESPN. I was like, first of all, when you have a, ch- a coach like Belichick, obviously you're a contender, like hands down. Yeah. But they have a young like, I don't, Yeah. I don't think that this season was just like um, an accident, dude. It's just like this, they're good. They always have been good. They took a year, two years off and now they're just right back at it. It's yeah. disgusting. It's not fair. <laughs> it's not. And they're, yeah. yeah, they're young quarterback. I mean, they got rid of, um, you know, uh, oh my God, what's his name? Tom Brady, right? No, Tom. But then this year, because they didn't know who was. Uh, Cam uh, Newton, pitchers. yeah. Yeah, they got rid of Cam. Yeah. And, you know, went with their young guy and he's doing fine. But everyone's like, now it's a running game. You know, and now they're Tom saying that Cam Newton might be done too because, like, the team he got drafted by, he didn't even do well there. So, what, what's next for him? So, we'll see on that. And then yeah, Joe Burrow, that guy just tore it up this weekend. He had five touchdowns and 530 something yards. Yeah. It's like, I, was what? <laughs> that's a, that's a first round, that's a first draft, like, first overall draft pick kind of game you want. Yeah. No, he, it was amazing, amazing. Um, and then back to uh, I want to talk. Houston beat the Chargers. Houston's four. Yeah, now. that was an upset. <laughs> yeah, the like, Chargers whoa. are now eight seven. It's like, what happened there? I mean, it's no the cool I thing. Think it, go any ahead. given Sunday, we say it all the time. Any given Sunday. Well, and your Wentz wagon didn't he just test positive for COVID? I mean, everyone's getting it. Yeah. So whether you're he still won. He's un- he's unvaccinated though, so he'll right. have to wait longer to to sit out. Well, and that's the thing, all the new, my God, he's totally mowing the lawn in back of me. Um, All the new protocols now, if you're vaccinated and boosted now, maybe, and even the airlines are trying to do this. You only have to wait five days and not 10. Yeah. I saw that yesterday. They it's, this is the times where like, you're like, okay, what is going on here? Like you're changing stuff every day. I'll have to keep up on it. Yeah. The good thing so, was that there was football almost every night of the week last week because of it. Yeah, that was, cool. that was cool. That was cool. I know that last year was the first time that they had NFL games every day of the week because of the schedule changes and the uh, with the COVID and whatnot. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. So I was like, Yeah, oh. it is. Well, that that was kind of fun, and because it snowed in Seattle, that's funny. Yeah, my sister in law Molly was very excited about her um, Bears beating the Seahawks. She was very yeah. Happy. And she Nick told Foles me, is the man. Um, I want to get to the schedule r- real quick for coming up. Like you said, someone has to win, lose, and then someone fall off something and have COVID. Yeah. Break fall. <laughs> someone has to have COVID with their co, you know, their toe. Well, and COVID. you're in Sun Valley and thank you for working because um, obviously a lot of people can't and a lot of people are getting it who are all vaccinated. I am doing this all the time now. Yeah. That, I know you're in the laundry room. I'm in a room by myself. I'm in the laundry room because everybody else is over there. So. They're prepping. Who's if you on couldn't today? tell, that's a uh, <laughs> your brother. I have no idea. I will see. It's kind of like Amanda. Yeah, Amanda. It's uh, lots of fun here. Well, be nice. Uh, flying out of Seattle is crazy, not to get all personal. But this, um, let's see, Sunday, January 2nd, uh, Atlanta, Buffalo. Does Buffalo need to win that game? Uh, probably. and But I think they will because Atlanta's not very good. Yeah. Uh, New York, Chicago. They're both four and 11. Chicago. Uh, here's Kansas City and Cincinnati. Now, Kansas City clinched. Uh, but... Kansas City. Oh, I think that uh, Joe Burrow will win that game, though, because they'll probably not rest all their players. Yeah. Uh, Miami and Tennessee. Tennessee is 10 and 5, and Miami is on a hot Miami. Street. They're on the, the fire wagon. Let's go. Uh, Vegas, Las Vegas and Indianapolis. That's playoff contention right there. We're going to go, I'm going to go without Carson Wentz. We're going to go with the Raiders. Yeah. I'm going to go with the Raiders too. And then Tampa Bay, New York Jets, bleh. and then have Philadelphia and Washington. I'm going with your Philly all the way to the Super Bowl, baby. I hope so. Yeah. I don't know about the Super Bowl, but yeah, I'll go with this game. <laughs> <laughs> or into the playoffs. Okay. Here's yeah. one. Arizona and Dallas. I'm Dallas, going Dallas all the way. I'm I mean, going- Arizona's just falling off the cliff. They're going to make it to the, they're, they're going to make the playoffs and lose the first round. Yeah. Green Bay, and Minnesota. Um, I'm going to go Bay, Green Bay. all the way. And then Monday, Cleveland and Pittsburgh. Who knew Cleveland and Pittsburgh would have a most. I'm going to go big Ben for his last game. Let's go. 
Yeah, he, they were saying his family was there last week and he's traveling them. So I think he's ready to retire. And also on a lighter note, Jaguars interviewed ex, uh, Doug Peterson, the old Super Bowl winning Eagles coach who has a statue with Nick Foles outside the stadium. I Only think- coach to get fired and have a statue. He got fired. <laughs> That's awesome. He's got a statue outside the stadium. <clears throat> well, we're coming down. It's week 17 out of 18 because they added a week this yep. year. So it should be good watching, and um, we're going to keep this short and sweet. So, by the way, Mark Pattison is up, and he is amazing. He uh, played for the Huskies. Uh, it's part two with him. And this week, last week, we talked all about his career in football. And this week, he summited every seven the seven peaks on the highest That's cool. on every continent. And he is amazing. He lives in Sun Valley. Um, doesn't go into Grumpy's a lot because then he said he'd drink beer and eat burgers because he's such a health fanatic. <laughs> <you know? laughs> yeah, I hope so. I love that. But um, he's on. And the great thing, he, it, it's super fascinating. So stay tuned for that. And Trev, be safe because you and your I brother will. are the only two that <laughs> are working. I'm going to mask up time. right now. Thanks I know we're masking up here. We're here. not going out. They're golfing. They're, we're masking up. And there goes the guy. So, um, Trev, we will still not see you next week. We'll do the same thing. Okay, but I miss cool. you. All right. Have fun watching you guys football, soon. dude. Okay. Tell them, go, tell them go Niners. Okay, I will. All right. See you later. See ya. Bye. Welcome back to Beyond the Locker Room, part two with Mark Pattison. It's Pattison, correct? Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> with the last name, like Preka G.C., I always like to, you know, enunciate properly. So last week we talked all about your football career from playing in the schoolyard and in back of your house to the pros. So I want to go life after football into all of your climbing experiences. Mm -hmm. So last week you said something like, you know, you're only as good as your last play or whatever. What was that last play like? And because you you went to three different you were in three different teams on three different teams. Yeah. So it it was interesting because um and it really turned out to be kind of a death sentence for me. But um the, the, you know for years and years and years the the NFL PA had been fighting for free agency. They didn't they 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 couldn't see how the owners had all the power which they always did. And once you got drafted to a team, unless you were released, you couldn't go anywhere that you wanted. Yet at the same time, uh, a team could trade you. They could cut you. They had literally held all the power. And so they finally came to an agreement where they had this thing called Plan B. And Plan B was a free agency thing where a team could select X amount of players of the roster, maybe you know 20 of their players that they could designate on this Plan B program. And so when I was in New Orleans, um, everything was going great. I mean, fantastic. And um, uh, Plan B came around, and this is my going into my third year there. And so a bunch of teams reached out, and they wanted me to come. Um, and, you know, they these teams are all offering more money, signing bonus, all that kind of stuff. And so I ended up getting a deal from the Seattle Seahawks. Tom Flores had t- taken over. My old coach from the Raiders had taken over as the president and GM of the Seahawks. And so they lured me up there and that's where I ended up going. And it was the most miserable experience of my life. Um, You know, from the players really not accepting me, they'd had their same gang for a long time and I was going to come in and take one of their players positions. And then the other part, part and point too, is that the head coach was a guy named Chuck Knox, longtime famous coach. And he and, and uh, Tom Flores were not on the same page. So the eight free agents that they brought in, every single one of us got cut. And so, it, you know, kind of coming out of that hole, I was so exhausted. I'd been playing big time football for such a long time, over 10 years. And I finally said, you know what? I want to go do some traveling. I want to go do some things I've never been able to do. And I was just burned out. You know, I didn't want to go back. And you got to have that edge if you're going to stay in it. And I felt like I'd lost that edge and didn't have that same desire and passion because I'd been so defeated from that experience. I look back on it now and it just was what it was at that time. And things all always happen for a blessing. So there's no ill will. It was just a circumstance. It came up. I made the wrong choice. And all you can do is learn from it as you move forward. So you said, forget it. You're not going to go back to old teams, other teams. What was that transition like? Because you were so much all about football for so many years. 
Yeah, it was really hard. You know, the first couple of years, I just, you know, I, I didn't have my identity or my identity was really caught up in me, Mark as the football player and all this stuff. And so, you know, it's really hard because financially you go from college when we're all a bunch of knuckleheads and nobody's making anything. And now I'm, you know, in the, the six figure category, you know, top whatever percent. Um, and all my other buddies are, you know, climbing the ladder. And now the kind of the inverse happened where now, now I'm 30 years old and they've been weaving and climbing the ladder. And so they're starting to get stability in their career and very focused on what they want to do. And now I have to go back down to the bottom and I'm at zero, right? And so it was like trying to figure out like how all that was going to work and my ego was in the way and, and things like that. So, you know, it was definitely a two-year progress of really trying to find my purpose and what I was going to do. And really, I had no skills to do anything. I mean, you know, I could communicate and things like that. But, you know, I hadn't, like what I had learned in school and political science, I mean, that gave me no roadmap towards, you know, anything in life, any functional skills to go out and help another company. So what did you do? I mean, two years where you just, you know, did you get up? You're so motivated now. I can't even imagine. But people go through ups and downs all the time. You know, look at Michael Phelps. You know, he started the whole mm -hmm. mental health, you know, bandwagon. I And I don't mean that in disrespect because I think it's totally, totally wonderful. But what did you do? What finally got you off your butt and said, okay, I need to find a job. I need to find out what I want to do. Well, I, fortunately, you know, I, I was still wired the way I am today. And so I wasn't doing anything. It just isn't had and clicked in. So, you know, there's an idea of, was I going to coach? And I kind of, you know, kick some tires there. And was I going to broadcast? And so I kicked some tires there and go into a broadcasting school um, and things like that. And at the end of the day, just none of those things really had my passion. And, you know, again, I was keeping myself busy and I was doing a lot of different things, but it wasn't really progressing the ball down the field for anything that I could see long term. And then um, kind of that second year mark into it, I'd run into a, 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 um, a old friend and he had talked about this marketing company that he was a part of. And essentially he was going out and when, and especially me being from, from Seattle, when these Microsoft and Amazons and Starbucks and companies like that, when, as they were just really launching and taking off, there was all these opportunities to go in and help them um, and all this promotional marketing, you know, material stuff. So getting, you know, they, they're, they're going to have a big conference. Microsoft is going to have a gigantic conference and they would literally be ordering hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars of merchandise to support that event. And so I got into that business, which really served as between the broker, between the vendor, the manufacturer of these different products and the customer facing the Microsofts, the Amazons, the Starbucks of the world. And so I did that for, an, and that just really helped me like jump in for like step, big step one in terms of business 101 and how to do things. Well, speaking of Starbucks, I read on one of your bios that you were responsible for the green umbrellas. <laughs> yeah, no. Just give me a tidbit of why they said that. On, it was probably Wikipedia or something, but. Yeah, I'm not, I, I don't, I wouldn't say I was, well, I guess technically that's, yeah, no, that, that's, it's technically correct. You know, one thing that, you know, if I go back even today, like if I start today and if we, you and I, we're not going to do this, but if we went back, you know, all these parts are interchangeable and they're all connected. So One's not a complete diversions, even though that what I'm about to talk about, the green market umbrellas for Starbucks is completely different than Sports Illustrated. Everyone had a connective piece to get me to where I am today, and they all count. Uh, so I'm in, I'm in this world of promotional marketing, and things are going really well. And um, uh, I had heard from somebody that Starbucks was looking to renew their market, uh, outdoor market campaign. I didn't even know what an outdoor market umbrella was. I from Seattle, and you know, we just put those things up, but I had no clue what those are or what they were. And so I, I come in. This is classic. You know, this is life lessons too. Because I picked up the phone, I called the front office desk of Starbucks. Some nice gal answered the phone. I said, "I'm looking for the person responsible for the outdoor market umbrellas." She patched me right through to her. This gal named Angela picked up the phone. And somehow or another, whatever came out of my mouth, I told her I could do it. I had extreme knowledge, domain knowledge and what, what these things were. And I thought I could be the vendor and help them, you know, to this next level. It took me two and a half years to get that account, two and a half years. But essentially what that was, um, for those who, that who are listening, 
It's the green outdoor market umbrellas that you see outside of most Starbucks. Um, and they're really, they're, for them, they're not umbrellas. They are signatures. They're, they're signage. And so I ended up learning how to um, export fabric to um, China. I set up a supply chain um, out of Hong Kong. Um, we manufactured the bases and the umbrellas, and then we routed them through on various shipping containers to the East Coast and the West Coast. And then we have them offloaded and sent to their distribution centers. So I didn't know a thing about what I just came out of my mouth. And I had to learn all this stuff on the fly. And I learned it. And I went to China many times and, you know, I got it. I nailed it. I nailed it. I had that account for 14 years. It was a multi-million dollar account. And it just showed that the, the kind of, to me, like the whole perseverance of sticking with account. And a lot of times people, you know, they'll, they'll make a couple calls and they give up after three calls if somebody's not returning a call. And for me, like, I don't even think the game is starting to, to happen until I like, call number seven, right? And so it's the longevity of what you're trying to do and, and sticking with it and just having a strategy of how you're going to get to the other side. And that has really taught me a lot in terms of my business arc and where things have gone, you know, from that one experience with Starbucks. And by the way, they were awesome to work with. They were just fantastic. Really, really great company. I love it. Well, I always tell people, I'll, I'll meet people and they're like, I want to learn about TV. I said, look, I'm where I am today because my mentor, boss, now business partner, I called him, you know, you can't call every single day for six months, but I yeah. said, you have to reach out. You have to follow up. And I tell people, I go, here's my card, follow up with me or don't, it's your choice. And a lot of them from the rodeo I just got back from are, and I said, that's why I have my career today is because I followed up with this one man. I'd never met him. And I just kept going. So what about this rodeo? What about this job? What about, you know, and just, we became friends and now he's, he, he is, he's my mentor, best friend, and now business partner. His wife's name is Marita. So sometimes he'll call me and go, oh, wrong one. Marie and Marita. <laughs> Awesome. But no, it's it's things like that. So fast forward to now you're with Sports Illustrated. I was just looking mm -hmm. online this morning too. You've gone from number 12 to number five. No. And how'd you get the job at Sports Illustrated? And what do you do there? Well, I actually, I, I started, we started a, um, uh, a technology company five years ago called Maven. And, and, and I'll, I'll make this story really clear and really short. And the whole idea was just to be the power, the engine behind um, big brands. Um, fast forward today, we have over 300 brands on our single technology platform, History Channel, Biography Channel, Maxim Magazine, Yoga Journal, many of those types of brands that you know. Two years ago, we had an opportunity to buy The Street with Jim Cramer, which we did, and also Sports Illustrated. It was up for sale. Um, we didn't get the sale. We didn't get the, the win. Um, another gigantic conglomerate um, beat us uh, for Sports Illustrated. But because we all came out from a company called scout.com, which is a collection of team sites, mostly college, um, and we had operational experience, that company was sold to CBS. Uh, we um, turned around and did a 100-year license deal with ABG, which is the name of the parent company that owns Sports Illustrated. So we are now, we call it own, uh, owned and operated. We don't actually own them, but we operate them. And... Um, and, you know, it's gone amazingly well. There was quite a few bumps out of the out of the gate, um, but we've really come together. We've got new leadership uh, in place. You know, we started with 18 of us in the company. Of the 18, I think there's only two of us left, but the company has grown to almost 400 employees. And so, you know, it's been insane growth. And so my main responsibility has been to grow Sports Illustrated. And so I've done that in a couple of different ways through acquisition, through I, I started a, a, a vertical, um, which has been over the moon successful. Um, and that's all driven that growth. And it was funny because um, and we'll get into Mount Everest here soon. But, you know, it's like I put a goal out there. I wrote it down. I, I announced it to everybody in the company on these executive calls. And I said, we're going to get to number five this year. And we started at. Um, like I said, number 12, 22.5 million visitors per month um, as measured on Comscore, which is the same thing on te television with Nielsen. And uh, we just got word a couple of days ago that we hit number five at 62.5 million. So if, if you can imagine, you know, growing over 40 million viewers in one year, it's pretty remarkable. And so now I have my, my site set on ESPN, which is number one. And the hill gets super steep. But again, we go back to that same question that we were talking about 
um, last week um, about why not me? Why can't I be the guy to make the team? Why can't I be the guy to take us to number one? Why can't I be the guy to climb the seven summits, first NFL player and climb Mount Everest, right? You know, why, why can't you? And the answer is we can, but you got to like take those limitations off. So it allows you to like crush it and go forward and then go with the right strategy and how are you actually going to get there? Well, and I love announcing goals, not to be, you know, you're not boastful. It's like, this is what we're going to do. If you don't announce them and you don't write them down, they're not goals. They're just thoughts in your head. And my big thing is the answer is always no, unless you ask. Well, it's funny because when I, when I started saying this, I had other executives say, Mark, you don't want to say that because we don't want to you know, overpromise under, under deliver. You know, you want to do just the other, other way. And I said, you know what? I don't care because I, you know, if we don't make it, we don't make it, but at least it's going to get us close. And as of like a month and a half ago, we were at number seven, the NFL had pushed up and moved in front of us. I said, that's going to be temporary because the NFL, you know, they're getting their numbers because this is now the time of season where there's a bump in ratings and, and everything, but we are, we are creating much more of a horizontal grassroots um, foundation that's going to take us high and wide. And so, and that's exactly what's happened. And I believe for that exact same strategy too, we're going to take over and out ESPN. In the, and I think it's going to be in the next two or three years. I don't think this is, you know, in 12 months. But, you know, we're doing all the right things. We're bringing in the right people to help really take what we've brought to the table and really make that thing grow. I love it. Well, let's transition from there because why not you? I know that you grew up in Seattle. You hiked a lot. Jim Moore is a dear friend. You guys hiked and um, kind of coached each other. Or he helped coach mm-hmm. you. But did you just wake up one morning and go, I want to, you know, climb all seven? No, man. I was, uh, you know, look, you know, my, my sense is I'm, I'm just getting to know you and you've got, you have a wonderful spirit about you. Um, yet at the same time, we all go through different bumps in life. Right. And I was going through my bump, um, 10 years ago. And, you know, after being married for 24 years with my ex for 30, she didn't want to be married anymore. And it was really heartbreaking. And so, you know, it was really me trying to get refocused on something because I felt like it was just spinning out of control and I had no control and I don't do well in quicksand and just, you know, not moving. And so I need to be always be moving towards something or it does, just doesn't, you know, bode well with my personality. And so um, this, and, and by the way, this was not like an overnight thing, like, Hey, I'm going through this rough time. Let's do this. I mean, it was two years of like, how do you, how do you get out of this? How do you, you know, there's kids involved and there's a lot of other things like that, that complicate it. And, and so, um, I, and I don't, I don't, I can't tell you what the exact thing and I, and I, and I've really tried to focus in on it hard, but the bottom line is one morning I woke up and it was just like, you know what, I'm done with this. I am done, done, done with being in this stuck place. And I need to like push forward, but I need something that's really going to help me pull myself out of it. And so I changed that question from how did I get here to what am I going to do about it? Right. And once I did that, it really seemed to open the floodgates and I had this new surge of energy um, with me. And and so growing up in Seattle, um, like you were talking about and following a lot of the legends, you know, the Whitaker brothers and and Jim Wick Wire and Ed Veasters and all these other guys. And a lot of those guys live here now. It's fun to call them friends. But, you know, I'd followed them and read their books and seen their movies and everything. And so I was always super fascinated. And I always felt like, you know, those guys had actually climbed Mount Everest. I just always had a, uh, just a mad respect for those. Like I, I, just, I just, almost more than a football player, you know, I held those guys in such awe for what they were able to do. And so um, I went home and I, I typed on the computer and Google and I said, has any NFL player ever climbed the seven summits, the highest peaks on each continent? And the answer was no. I said, you know what? I'm going to be that guy again. Why not me? And so, um, you know, essentially nine, 10 years ago, I started on this journey and, you know, again, it, it took me nine, 10 years to get there because COVID, you know, shut down the world in 2020. And so I had to postpone it then 2017, I got stuck in minus 80 degree weather on Denali up in Alaska. So I had to go back down and then reset everything and go back up there and pay again and, you know, do all that stuff. And so, you know, life isn't always perfect and we, we have to traverse here and there. But at the end of the day, you know, I got to that, that end goal, uh, May 23rd, 2021, five months, five, six months ago, I was able to step, step uh, on top of the world. 
And it was just like completely incredible that I was able to pull this off. Now, at the time, I went through hell and back on summit day. We can get into that to get there. So I couldn't appreciate it like I'm appreciating it right this moment. But still, at the end of the day, there was a goal. I put it out there. I stated it. I went on social media. I said, this is what I'm going to do. It took me nine, 10 years to accomplish that goal. But at the end of the day, I got it done. Well, and it was like the Olympics being canceled. Everyone's at their prime. They're at their top. Yeah. And all of a sudden they have to wait a year. Do they continue on? Do they, you know, what was that training like? Cause you were training and I'm sure you had this whole regiment in front of you and all of a sudden it gets postponed. Well, one of the things that I think I'm, I'm a little bit different than, than, than many or most, I'm not sure where I fit, but I, I love the process, you know, and I'm really committed to it. And I think a lot of times, you know, like one of the, like the three things that I've learned out of a lot of my adversity and coming back. Cause at the same time, when I was going through this challenge 10 years ago, my dad died of a massive stroke and I was tied with him. So yeah, it was just like, bang, bang, bang. Okay. What else can happen? Right. And my therapy, my meditation, my yoga, if you want to call it is working out. And I just find so much peace and gratification and climbing up and down these mountains. And, and so stepping into the fear, having daily discipline to go after that goal and do it with full on commitment. Too many people, you know, they have a new year's resolution. They want to lose weight. They want to do this. They want to do that. And then by about March, they fall off because it's too hard. And that consistency, like, ah, I just want to sleep in 10 more minutes. And it doesn't matter if I'm out late the night before or not, I'm still up and at them and doing my thing. And I get out there and I put these goals in front. And, you know, I know that in order to achieve X, I have to do Y. And this, again, all goes back to that blueprint of success that I was talking about with Don James that really helped me understand what it takes to accomplish big things. And again, same thing with Sports Illustrated that I've done, not in the workout sense, but in the daily discipline of what I have to do. Same thing on mountain climbing, going up and down Baldy every single day here in Sun Valley. You know, you're here. Um, same thing in the, in the NFL of running the stairs and and lifting weights and studying film. And, and it's the exact same thing. I've, 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 you know, it's really a copy and paste, copy and paste, same type of thing. But at the end of the day, you have to have that in, the internal engine to keep going. Now on this last one, I'll make this quick. On this last one, um, when COVID shut down the world, you know, obviously I was super disappointed. I put in so much time. I've been skinning up and down the mountain, putting in all this vertical I'd driven out to LA, bags packed, ready to go. And then I was like within seven days of, of launching to Nepal and the world shuts down. And I was, I was really down for probably two or three days. And then I popped out of it and I said, you know what? I'm going to reset my goal. I'm going to redefine what I'm trying to do. And I'm going to be even bigger and better and a more aggressive goal. And so um, my daughter has epilepsy. And so I had, I've been involved in philanthropy of raising money for her. Um, for the last couple of years with a, again, with a group here in some Valley called Higher Ground. Um, and so I said, not only am I going to go up and climb Mount Everest, but I'm going to come back down, jump into town for a couple of hours, and then go up the fourth highest mountain in the world, Lhotse, and then come down on the other side. There's only a few people who've done that. And it's madly impossible and difficult and all those things. And at the end of the day, I failed on that goal. But at, at, but at the same time, I mean, I, I, I summited Mount Everest, but I, we ran into all kinds of problems from being snow blind to running out of oxygen to not eating in three days in a cyclone. And so those things just, I had to change the game plan once I was there. But what fueled me was that I had to go do these peaks because I didn't know what was going to happen, right? That all those things that happened to me on summit day happened. And so I just had to put a big goal out there, a big, hairy, audacious goal and make sure that I could go execute it. And, and to execute it, I was going to have to even take myself to another level of exercise. You know, I put on, I think, 150,000 vertical feet last or earlier this year, January, February, March, going up and down that mountain. So it's just what you have to do to prepare for something grand like that. Well, it's crazy. I take the chairlift up, by the way, but I know <laughs> a lot of my friends all skin. They're like, come on. I'm like, I will, I will. I like my hiking, but it's just... I mean, it's 3,000 vertical feet. It's a, it's a big mountain. Yeah, well, if you're, you're, what mountain were we talking about now? No, Baldy. just Baldy, just outside yeah, of no, Dorian. Yeah, no, it's, well, it's at 6,000 feet. And that's, I, 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 again, going to that back about, you know, really committing. Like, what are you committing to do in life, right? And, and so this is, again, these are all lessons I've learned. Like, yeah, are you in? Are you all in? And so, 
for me, I was living in Hermosa Beach. This is four years ago. And I said, you know, if I want to be all in, I'd climb like four out of the seven at the time. If I want to be all in, I, I need to move to a place that has got altitude. So as you know, we both live at roughly 6,000 feet. And so you're already starting to capture those red blood cells that carry oxygen, more oxygen around your body, just to better function, you know, when you're at higher elevations. And so I was one of the only ones out of our group. And there's a bunch of people in our group this year that everybody was on this high altitude medicine called Diamox. And it just helps with the way your, your blood flows around your body and you can sleep better at night and things like that. And I didn't take any Diamox when I was on the mountain. And so I was able to go to the very top and go down, you know, so without any of that. And a lot of people get really sick and a lot of people have a lot of problems. And, um, you know, I think part of my success was because again, I spent all this time here. And when you're going from 3000 feet, even though you're only saying only 3000 feet, you're still going from six to nine, 10,000 feet, you know, to get up there and back down. So it's just all that practice. It all counts. It all counts. I know. I love going to, when I have to go to Vegas or Houston for rodeos, I'm like, we on the treadmill. It's, <laughs> it's so easy. Funny thing. So the day you summited, it first off 70 days total from when you arrived to when you summited, 25 pound weight loss. Yeah. That's crazy. But you always, and I've seen a lot of articles, you said the summit day was not your best day. How did you keep going? Because you're like, oh, I would think you'd be like, okay, it's the last little bit. Yeah, 18, 19 hours round trip, not a little yeah. bit. But how did you keep going that day? And then I want to talk about the eeriness of, you're going by people that didn't make it that aren't off the mountain and that that's their resting place. Well, one of them was, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll answer the second one first and then go to the first. Yeah. So I am stepping over dead bodies up there around the Hillary step. And one of those bodies was it's my tent mate from Antarctica, Don Cash um, from 2019 uh, in January, we'd been down there. We climbed together and his plan was a couple months later after coming off that mountain in Antarctica called Vincent Massif, is in to fly to Nepal and take on that. And that was the year that they had the famous um, gigantic lines going up the mountain because the weather had not cooperated. And so the one day that the sun popped out, everybody went for it, which created that gigantic log jam. And for him, he wasn't a great climber and uh, super nice guy, but he just hadn't put the work in. He wasn't completely committed and in. And he paid a dear price. He got to the very top, raised his hand, fell over. And, you know, there I was stepping over him, you know, going up the mountain. And it's really interesting because as you and I sit here right now, it's, it's like you can have a lot of empathy and compassion and emotion about thinking about, oh, my God, you're stepping over dead bodies. When you're up there, all you're thinking about is self-preservation, Right. Um, it is so steep and it's so hard and the air is so thin and you're just barely making it. In my case, we had, we had um, committed to going up the mountain on the 15th, right? So we're going to get up at, at three o'clock in the morning and this was going to be the final push. And so off we go. And the goal was to be standing on the top of the mountain on the 20th. Well, when we got up to camp three, which is no place to be stuck because you're on a 45 degree slant in stick in these tents, we were stuck up there for three days. And, and one of the things that my body does not function well on is freeze dried food. And when you're up there, that's all, you know, it's, it's minimal uh, things that you're eating. So part of that 25 pound loss. And for me, you know, I'm kind of a tall, skinny guy and I don't have a whole lot of weight to lose. And so when you're losing 25 pounds and I looked awful when I, when I came off the mountain, there was a selfie that was taken compared to one the day before I left. And it was just like, I mean, it's telling like a pictures could tell a thousand words. That was it. And, and, you know, the whole thing is about energy, right? And when you haven't eaten for three days, I would challenge you to then go, you know, just walk up to the post office. And if you don't have energy, you don't have energy. And so like of all the days of 365 days, 364 of those, I felt fantastic. I think all that one other day, maybe on the mountain, I wasn't at my best, but I wasn't awful. And that day, you know, from the time that, that, that they woke us up, they, 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 they woke us up late because the, the tents were all like a mishmash up at camp four and it looked like literally a war zone. So we were supposed to have an hour to get ready. We had 20 minutes 
And then we get outside the tent and it is blowing 45, 50 miles per hour. And on top of not eating for a couple of days and just surviving on these little candies that I had, um, uh, I didn't put on the right kind of eyewear. And now I get snow blind in the left eye. And I get scarred all the way on my, my left side of my face. I've got the oxygen on. And, and the thing about when you come out of camp four, which is, it's really eerie. And I thought a lot about it because that's that the bit, that big disaster in its in era. Um, all that craziness, much of it took place just right outside that camp where Beck Weathers and these other ones where they couldn't find each other. And you could see easily how that would happen because you're up there and it's blowing and it's crazy and it's super steep. And, and it would be very difficult to, uh, you know, if you got lost or if there was a wide out, like how you'd manage and figure, find your way back into camp. Anyways, you know, off I went, didn't have a lot of energy and I just struggled the whole time. And so back to your question, like, how did you keep going? I had to tap into all the people that I love and love me, my daughters, right? Dars, um, my mom, you know, I was thinking about all my friends and just getting up there. It was just like, I'd take a step and then I go, okay. Now I got to go another 10 feet. Just give me 10 feet and go. And that's just, it just took me forever to do that same pace. And I felt like I was being dragged up the mountain. And then once we finally got up there, you know, it's, I ended up, I was the last person standing on top of the world. If you could imagine that. And my Sherpa had taken off and I'm like, all right, <laughs> we're, oh my guys, right? <laughs> like, you're like, like, well, and you're not used to being last in anything, I'm assuming. <laughs> no. And the whole time I was either first, second, or third of a group. And it was never a race, but it's just, you know, I was just one of the stronger guys on the team. We had a guy that summited the oldest American ever, Art Mirror, 75 years old. And, you know, as you can imagine, he uh, had a couple Sherpas that were helping him get up the mountain. And, um, and he went at a really slow pace. He's a wonderful guy and he's a good climber but he just goes at a different pace than I go. And he would be the first one to tell you that. Um, but his pace worked for him. He left, I think three hours before we took off so that he could just have a nice, easy plodding way up the mountain. And, you know, he had a much better experience based on that final day, based on his strategy and also eating, you know, than, than I did. And so, you know, when I was coming back down, I, I ran out of oxygen and that created a whole new set of problems. And, you know, it just, I've never been on the edge of like, I mean, I'm talking about the true edge of life and death and it was really scary. And, you know, I'm so blessed to be sitting here talking to you. I'm so grateful for this conversation. And, um, you know, really, I mean, I always have counted my blessings, but I think more than ever, of really understanding how fragile life can be and how close I was to that edge. Well, and then I have to ask, mm -hmm. what's the first thing when you got off the mountain, what's the first thing you ate and drank? And how <laughs> long did you sleep? Um, well, that was a whole nother crazy story. And it was a crazy story because um, when I got back down to my tent, so I finally get back down and now that's like 6 PM at night, you know, I'd started and that's it. still camp four. You got to go down a long ways. We were going to spend the night at camp four. Well, at the time too, the plan was still for me to go back up Lodzi. So I, you know, I made the call coming down. Like if I had to go do this, I will die for sure. There's no question about it. And so, um, I climbed in my tent, I'd run out of oxygen. I'd gotten another tank. Um, uh, I started breathing again. Everything was fine. And then about nine o'clock that night, uh, I ended up running out of oxygen again. And this is how things really, you know, go, go off the tracks and how people die. And I'm so lucky. I'm, again, I'm sitting here. You know, my first one was coming down and running out of O's. My second one was when I'm sitting in the tent, um, I, I'm, 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 I run out of more O's. And so I was, in, I was in my tent with this another gal. And I go, you know, her name is Koki. I go, Koki, I ran out of O's. And she goes, well, okay, I'm, I'm pretty sure like 30 feet away outside the tent, there was a stockpile of these tanks. Just run out there, grab one and come back in. I go, are you sure? She goes, yes. And so now the, all the storm had kicked up again. The cyclone was happening. And, and before that, I had taken off my socks. Um, so I'm in my suit. I'd taken off my socks because you're, you're creating body heat. And I wanted to dry out my socks for the next morning going down the mountain. And so the whole idea at the time, this is my logic, was to almost like we're here in Sun Valley. It's a big snowstorm. We're in the hot tub together. 
And now you're like, hey, can you go get two beers? And so I go, okay. So I'm running the, the little feet. different scenario. Right, right. Yeah. But that was my mentality. Like, I'm just going to run out in the snow and the barefoot. And, you know, it's snowing, it's cold and everything else. But, but I'm, you know, so I'm going to run over, grab the beers, I'm going to dash back in, dive in the hot tub, and it's all good. Right. And so um, I, I dash out, I'm in my bare feet, I'm, I'm out there looking, and this stockpile is not there. And it's blowing like you can't believe. And it's freezing. I've got this headlamp. I'm out there, I'm looking all over. And it, I mean, I couldn't find it. And so I, I ended up, I was out there probably uh, probably a good five minutes. And it's such a stupid thing to be out there in your bare feet at 26,500 feet in a cyclone looking for tanks of which now I'm depleted because there is a third less. So I come running back in, I bang on the tent, they unzip it, I dive in there. And then Koki goes, okay, I'm going to go out and look. And so she goes out and she looks, there's no tanks. And so now uh, the lead Sherpa pokes his head in, in our tent about 10 o'clock. And I go, hey, I'm out of O's. And he goes, well, we're out. And so you just got to share it with Koki. Well, Koki and this other girl that were in the tent, they fall asleep and they're out. And so I spent the entire night um, with no O's at 26,500 feet. I was hallucinating. I was a mess. It was shivering. It was cold. Um, so lucky that I, I pulled through. I got up really early that next morning. And, some, and I don't recall right now how I got another tank, but I did. And they weren't out of O's. He just didn't want to go and get me another tank. But um, at the end of the day, I ended up going down from camp four to camp three to camp two by myself and down the steep uh, Lodzi face. I thought I was the last person coming out of camp. I turned out to be the first. And so I was going down these, these walls with no Sherpa, no guide, no anybody. And so, you know, again, here I, you're, you know, you're getting to what was the first thing you ate. And I'm still back at, like, I still had to, to you know, survive the night and then get down the steepest, most treacherous, you know, steep hills that you could possibly imagine on Mount Everest just to get to camp two. And then once we got to camp two, that was the first meal that they served. And it wasn't anything great. It was eggs or something, but, you know, at least it was a meal and it was like my first step. And then I ended up chartering a plane at camp one and flying off the mountain. And Koki and I were the only two people to get off the mountain because the cyclone hit again and it shut down everything first. So all those, all those climbers, whether they made it or not, were stuck on the mountain for another 10 days. And we escaped. We chartered planes from there to or helicopter back to Kathmandu. And then we got a plane out the next night. Um, I ended up in Qatar. Who goes to Qatar? Right. <laughs> that's where they just that's where they just negotiated the, the settlement talks with the Taliban, right? So yeah, I'm in Qatar I'm, running like, around. Like, I'm here. Okay, that's great. Now I'm out in Nepal, which is good. The whole country was shutting down because of COVID. And it wasn't just, excuse me, it wasn't just, you know, a couple of restaurants like they did here. You could still go to the grocery store like they did here, but you'd have to only so many people get in and you had to be six feet apart. And, you know, that they shut everything down, the airport, everything. So us getting out was a whole nother tale in itself, um, which happened. So blessed that we were able to get out. And once I did get back, I think it was I was sitting in business class flying into Qatar and sitting there with like a, a champagne thing and some dessert and some, you know, pecan <laughs> duck or something. It was great. I, I mean, like 24 hours before I was just like almost at my death, you know? So it was just so like surreal to be in that moment. Um, it, it was just, it was crazy. Crazy, crazy. What, I don't want to say what'd you take from all that. Obviously you have such a great outlook on life. Um, you set your goals, you're positive, you know, you know, you're blessed every day. I wake up every morning going, I'm blessed. My dad used to say, I read the obituaries. I'm not in them. It's going to be a great day, yeah. you know, but after that, and you know, cause it wasn't woohoo, I made it. And I just scrambled to the top. Like, I'm sure you kind of thought you were going to, yeah. because yeah. you've trained so hard. You already did all these other summits, but what is it that you take from that? Even today, as we sit here, and I know it's a cliche question, but, yeah. you know, is it just because you feel so blessed that you made it off that mountain that you did it? Is that more so than, oh, I summited Everest? Or is it more, I'm just blessed to be here and take that experience and move forward in my life? I think, um, you know, one of the things that really enforced um, to me as I forge ahead, or there's a couple of things in there. One is hard things are hard. And I, and I think that a lot of people, you know, they either want the shortcut to the top or, you know, they try a little bit, but they don't see any results. And there's a plan. God's got a plan for all of us on like what that that's going to look like. 
And you may not realize what that plan is till 10 years down the road. I never thought I'd be involved in philanthropy, right? That was a piece that came along the way. And now I'm highly involved with, with higher ground. Um, I never thought I'd be in podcasting. And that's been the biggest blessing. I don't make a penny from it. But I talked to all these people who have no arms, no legs, are blind. They do these amazing things. It helps. Like my currency and all that is, is, is um, the uh, humility and the appreciation for what these people are able to do to put that more, again, more perspective back in my life. Um, I, I think it also taught me about goal setting. Like it's so important for me. I'm kind of going through this right now a little bit. Like I've just accomplished this, this essentially 10 year goal. That's now at its conclusion. I just got back from code epoxy too, which I was just down there for my 60th birthday. I can't believe Woo-hoo! I said that. And um, you know, I ran up that mountain and it was a, it was a great experience. A hundred went for it. Only six of us made it. So I'm so blessed again to have threaded that needle. We ran into all kinds of crazy weather. Um, and as I look into 22, 23, 24 and beyond, it's like how I'm going to reinvent myself again. And I've had to pivot and, and turn multiple times. But again, I think it's, it's just like never satisfied with what you've done. Think of all the things I haven't done, but what's really going to turn my wheels to go, to go after those things. So really putting that pressure on myself to go figure out what that next thing and how I can impact others. And then the last thing, um, kind of back to your point, is my appreciation for people. And the people that really support me and have been there, you know, through this journey that I've been on um, of, it, it, you know, I had to do it, but it wasn't all about me. It was about the love and support that really came to play when I was coming down just under the balcony at 27.5 and I was running out of oxygen. I was scooting down my butt and I'm looking just like, I don't know if I'm going to make this. Right. And, and, and just thinking about individually, like all the different comments from these different people and my daughters and all this stuff that just kept feeding me to be pulled off that mountain. Um, and so that's not just a trivial thing. It's not like when you run into tough times, then that's when all of a sudden you become super religious. I think it's just more of just an ongoing gratefulness and thoughtfulness and, and uh, trying to be full of uh, empathy and, um, in just how important people are are in our lives and 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 how they've played such an important role to where I am today. Well, I'm going to wrap up this session, but um, I'm not going to let you go completely. We're going to catch up with you in a couple months and see where you're at and where the Sports Illustrated is at. Okay. And then talk a little bit too, maybe after the football season of what you thought this NFL season has just been bonkers. That's my term for the whole deal. It's been bonkers. Mm-hmm. Um, because we could stay here forever, but I have to go catch a plane, (laughs) but thank you. Thank you so much. Your story is amazing. We're going to put all the links below and we will talk to you soon. Um, but more don't Mark Patterson's going to be on in the next couple of months. Don't you worry about that and stay tuned for Maria's minute. Thank you so much for having me. Everyone. Welcome to Maria's minute. Maria here in Palm Desert, California. Uh, Thanks to Mark Patterson. What an amazing interview. And we're almost to the new year. So I just want everyone to be kind. It's crazy. We were stuck in Seattle for an extra day. You know, we went to the airport. It was insane. But we made it because we just stayed calm because there's nothing you can do. You can't argue with Mother Nature. And now look where I am. So anyway, uh, be calm, be positive. And especially if you're flying, um, thank everyone in the industry because they are struggling right now due to weather, COVID, everything. So be kind to them, be kind to yourself. And next year we'll talk New Year's resolutions because it's almost next year. All right. Uh, Thanks again to Mark Pattison. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button.